keep it open here. So now I have three machines that I have in my sermon, and I'm going to do this game. And instead of the, the time for all ages, I switch it. I'm going to do this game instead of read the time for all ages. So let's see if that works. Yeah, it's going to be chaos. But then I'm on here, and I also have, uh, I always keep the, um, the Book of Life okay. open. Good morning. Welcome. As people are uh, filing in, please take your time. And it's lovely to see everybody here um, in person. It's lovely to see everybody online. Let me look at the camera. I learned that the other day. Look at the camera now that we're in hybrid services. Because I would look at my phone and then be like, why is he looking down? Okay. It's lovely to see everyone. My name is Joshua Berg, and I am the sabbatical minister here at Emerson until Reverend Matthew returns. And for those of you who don't know, this is my last service as sabbatical minister. Oh, thank you. Yes. it's It's been so quick, but it's been so amazing and lovely. And I'm looking around at all the faces that I've got to know in such a short time. is such a blessing. So thank you all for hosting me. I will be in L.A. My wife said we're never moving from Southern California. So, <laughs> yes. So um, I will be the chaplain resident at Children's Hospital LA on Sunset for about a year, starting in August. So you can always stop by. I'm in my clowning class right now to prepare for that. So. <laughs> I'm serious. You think I'm taking a clowning class? Yeah. I have an emergency. Yes, I have actually that store over there. Open your heart. What's it called? Um, follow your heart. They have these little things that say emergency clown nose. And I bought two of them. Yeah. So anyway. So welcome. Let us worship together this morning, calling up the sacred and the spiritual in the question, how do we weave, strengthen, and upkeep the love-dependent web of all existence? Thank you. For those of you at home, feel free to gather your chalices there. <laughs> As we kindle this flame, may it spark in each of us connection and commitment to this living tradition and to each other. Our opening hymn. I guess we could do this one too. Ah, you try this one. 
Yeah, that's a better idea. Old school. Yeah. <laughs> Our opening hymn this morning is 318, We Would Be One. And our choir will be leading us all in the hymn, which is a very special thing. as well. I want to begin by acknowledging that our church is built on land stolen from those who have called it home for thousands of years. The nearby villages of Tatanga and Atasanga were a crossroads of cultures and language for the Tonga, Tata, Biam, and Chumash peoples. This land remains part of their enduring identity and heritage. We recognize that these tribes are still here, and we are committed to honoring their stories, culture, and community. So welcome all of you virtually and in person here to our service. Unitarian Universalists have many guiding principles. Our work for a better world calls us to harness love's power to stop oppression. As Unitarian Universalists, we put our faith into action, and we model these commitments by creating welcoming and inclusive congregations. We act in partnership with groups and communities most impacted by injustice. We stand on the side of love to work on ending oppression. It is who we are, what we believe, and what we do. We hope that you find a community of like-minded folks here in the spiritual sanctuary. Today, our sabbatical minister, Joshua Berg, will be speaking about our principles in his sermon, Spiritual Hugs. 
This will sadly be his last day, as he said. Um, Reverend Matthew returns in June. We have truly enjoyed your compassion, inspiration, thoughtfulness, humility, and authentic presence in our church. We will miss you and all that you've provided to us over these last several months. So we wish you the best in your work as a children's chaplain. I think everyone's going to be so happy to have you there. And good luck in your, in your endeavors and everything. If this is your first or second time visiting Emerson, then I extend to you a very special welcome, and I invite you to learn more about our guiding principles. I encourage you to get involved in things we offer here, uh, like choir. We have choir. We would love to have you in our choir. Small group ministries, books, and hiking clubs. So please sign our online guest book or the guest book here to learn more about upcoming events. And now... We will do our covenant. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and the service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity and fellowship, thus to be covenant. Love is Thank you, Melissa. Thank you all. So, um, one thing I've learned to do um, as a minister, sort of especially in this time of virtual worship and hybrid worship, is to embrace a little bit of chaos. So, if you wouldn't mind embracing it with me, instead of a time for all ages today, I'm going to do a game for all ages. So, can everyone who, first of all, if you don't have a phone, that's fine. If you have a phone, please take it out and open your cameras. Including online. So those who have phones online, please take them out and open your cameras. If you don't have a phone, you don't feel you can participate, or if you are watching the service online on your phone and can't open the camera, don't worry about it. Because in this new hybrid world, those who participate and those who are just spiritually present to witness are just as important. So you can participate or not. If you start participating and you get a little frustrated, just stop and, and take it all in. Um, so what's going to happen is now that we're all scanning menus, QR codes for menus, I'm going to put up a QR code. Um, and we're going to scan it. If you can, and online the QR code is up there as well. And once you scan it, a square will come up with a little a ghost logo in it, like a little avatar, and a plus sign. That's where you're going to press the plus sign, and you will select your own avatar. Um, there's a whole bunch to choose from. Oh, Conrad joined already, and he's the mouse. You can see people when they're joining. You'll select avatar, and then you'll put your name in there underneath the avatar. Um, like Melissa, you did it. Very good. Thank you. Kennedy is the cat. Oh, great. You guys are getting it. Noah? And if you can't, like I said, you can just watch the screen, and it'll be just as good. Yeah, there's a lot, so just whatever whatever your spirit feels. And that's what this is about. This is about connecting in spirit today. How do we do that in a digital world? This is one way I'm suggesting we do it. David Early, Susan Siskin, Jennifer, Sandy Ginsburg. Wow. I'll give it a few more minutes. People are coming on. You can see everybody joining. <laughs> Everyone's choosing their icon. <laughs> All right. That's right. You'll be able to see it on the 
screen. So we have a whole bunch. I'm going to move to the next screen now. And as you can see, if you press the little sound, the little uh, microphone in the side, like Susan just did, you can, you can send up a sound in an image. Um, let me turn on my volume so you can hear it. Anyway, so we're going to start with the word cloud to make it easy. You're going to type one or a few words in answer to the question, how is your spirit? So there should be a little brown box. You can type a word in and select submit. That's the noise that you can play with the little noises. So, and then you can select another word and, and put submit. And select another word and put submit. And this is how we're connecting in spirit virtually and in person. Awesome, wow. And you can keep doing that, but as I turn to the next page, when the word cloud, <laughs> thank you, Conrad. <laughs> as the word cloud starts to form, uh, yes, you can then scroll down and vote on other people's words. It's amorphous. So if you feel the same way they feel, you can vote on it, and that word will grow. Yes. <laughs> ah, thank you, Renee. <laughs> Joyful, grateful. So this is a great way to be in spirit and community, both virtually and in person. Everyone's participating. David, thank you. <laughs> grateful seems to be joyful. I love that. And unsteady, too, this is very real. Contented, rising, love, full, happiness. All right, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is Conrad is up there uh, participating. So this is, our, this is our spirit right now, together in the community. Now, I'm also, the next thing, now that you sort of get the hang of it, is hopefully we can do this. It's going to access your camera. Now, when I turn it here, you can read the instructions. We're going to do a beloved community vision board. So I want you to either, you can either stay seated or you can get up and explore your space, both online and in person. You can explore your house, however you want to do. And find something maybe that strikes your, your, your fancy, that, that moves your spirit, that inspires you, that or this or whatever, that, and, and that would connect with you in a moment in a positive way. And before, you're not going to be able to take a picture yet. Just hold on one second. It's, that's at the next slide. But with your phone, I'd like you to either take a single picture or you can select from one from your gallery. It will allow you to either select one from your gallery or take a picture, just one, and submit that. Um, so here we go. Now it should ask you to connect to your phone. And you can once again take a picture. And you're free if you want to walk around and take a picture of anything you want. If you take a picture of another person, please ask their permission. Anything you take a picture of will come up on the screen. So make sure those people online do. You're taking pictures of things that, that are okay for everyone to see. And this is sort of allowing us to embody spirit, to move around, to connect with each other, to connect with the spirit of the space. This space is also a minister to us, and we care for it as much as we care for each other more. Um, it takes care of us as well. So a bunch of pictures have come up. Awesome. <laughs> No, well, thank you. All right, and so now I'm just going to go through a few. And as I pull them up, you can like them or not. David, that's an awesome picture. I love that. Yes. Here we go, Renee. Oh! Who is that, Renee? I'll see in the chat. Eloise. Wow. Where was that? Oh, it's at home. It's one of your flowers at home. Conrad, that's what the booth looks like. For no one who's ever been up there, that's that's their view. <laughs> their view. Oh, Melissa. Very good. Where is that? Awesome. Thank you, Jen. Amy. Well, yeah. If not, you can show me the picture afterwards. This is awesome. Where is this, Amy? Oh, 
will see things I've never noticed. That's why, that's awesome. It's the carbonating. Anna. Todd, wow. Where was that? Oh, wow. Were you running or riding? Oh, wow. Well, I'm just going to go. Nice, Iris. That's awesome. Is that in here as well? No. Let's see how many do a few. Oh. I'll go through this little quicker. Brian. California has my heart. Awesome. Mine too. Susan. Beautiful. Adam like that one. Noah. Very cool. Oh, where's that? Oh, right there. Amen. All right. So this was just one way that I thought maybe in this. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> in, in this world of hybrid worship that people online and people in the sanctuary should connect in spirit. You know, how you feel, what moves your heart, what images can we share with each other. And, and so I'm just experimenting with that. Hopefully it's facilitated a connection in the room, across the internet, and into each other's homes. So thank you for, for taking part in that little bit of beautiful chaos. <laughs> all right. And with that, usually after the, um, I don't know why I'm putting this back on, usually after the time for all ages, we would say our, our affirmation. Um, so you can disconnect my computer. Can you just, that's my wife and kids, by the way. <laughs> if you want to disconnect mine, I'll turn it off. Oops. Oh, you're doing it. Okay. So we will say together our affirmation. You can repeat after me. We are Unitarian Universalists. A people of open minds, loving hearts, and welcoming hands. Thank you. Our financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and hard work. We are so grateful for this and commit together to ensure the funds we gather collectively do a greater good for ourselves and our world than, uh, than they could have done alone. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this congregation. For those of you joining online, you can give via the Banco app or at donate.emersonuuc.org. You can make checks out to Emerson UU Church or just EUUC. May we give in love and in hope. Thank you. as always. Um, being in beloved community, sharing spirit means we share positive as well as negative spirit sometimes and hold each other as we celebrate joys and hold each other as we mourn or as we grieve or as we have concerns. And so right now, we're going to share um, 
we have our uh, book of joys and concerns over there, book of life, and also online. Um, let's see here. Thank you. Oh, the first one, happy 18th birthday to Joshua's daughter. My daughter turned 18. Thank you. <laughs> and hope your mother's doing better. My, my mother fell ill. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Good luck to you, Joshua, and all your endeavors. We will miss you. Thank you, and I miss you as well. Um, thanks goes to Judy Garris uh, and friend for helping water our church garden and taking greens over to Prince of Peace. Food Bank. Eric has that joy. Thank you very much, uh, Judy Garris. We have an amazing garden. If you're new here and you haven't seen it, you'll get um, some greens. You can take some greens afterward. Eric brings them out of basket. It's wonderful. Um, my, and Noah says, my significant other's horse riding stable recently reopened after closing from the pandemic. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Um, Pat Cosgrove says, my sister Lisa is being released from the city of Hope tomorrow, where she has been treated for leukemia. She will continue treatment at a city of Hope facility in, in Lancaster, near where she lives. So, Pat, we hope for a full and speedy recovery for your sister. Um, and uh, Jan Wilson-Gonzalez says, my mother Jan's cancer has returned. So sorry. This is weighing heavy on my heart as we prepare to fight again. I will um, please send positive energy and love and spirit to everyone who's need, who needs it in this time. Um, I don't see anything in the Book of Life online um, unless it needs to reload. But I don't think so. So for all those joys and concerns, joys and sorrows that remain unspoken, we hold them in our heart. We hold them together in the beloved community. We lift them up with our spirits and strengthen each other. And as I mentioned, spirit is not always easy to share. Sometimes spirit is difficult to share, and it's all the more important to when it's difficult to love somebody, and yet you still love them unconditionally. And with that, I wanted to do a brief we usually do a brief meditation here, but I'm actually going to have a poem read that I found online. And if you'd like to uh, meditate while the poem is being read, or consider each other, consider your spirit, going together in spirit, consider your loved ones uh, while the poem is being read, please do so. Show me your darkest corners, and I will lie there. Take it to all the places you've hidden from the world. The places where you're too bad, too dirty, too loud, too big. Wherever you are too much or not enough, I will lie you there. Spare the hard shell of your perfection, for I want to see the soft flesh of your heart. Every failure, every bad thought, or worse deed. The ones you barely dare to whisper in the dead of the night when no one is around. Guide me to the dusty cupboard where you have shut your shame. In the hope that the light of the primal mind should never catch it sight. Where the prejudice, the perversion, the lies, and the guilt live. And the most shameful thought that plays your heart makes and calm sweats for the slightest chance that they can see it in your eyes or read it on your lips. Even there, I will love you. Show me your darkest corners, and I will love you there. For I know that your darkest corners are also mine. Will you meet me there and love me too? In 1995, I began my graduate training in community agency counseling at Ohio University. My undergraduate degree in women's studies and film hadn't opened up a lot of doors for me in Columbus, Ohio. 
After doing months of informational interviewing with psychologists, sex therapists, and counselors, I decided that pursuing a career in counseling would be fulfilling to me. I survived a suicide attempt when I was 16, and with the help of numerous counselors, had made some major improvements in my life and outlook. I felt that I could offer valuable help to people suffering from depression and anxiety. My first job as a counselor was at a privately owned outpatient mental health clinic in my birthplace, Parkersburg, West Virginia. I worked primarily with people who were insured through Medicaid and experienced extreme socioeconomic stress and trauma. I was incredibly nervous each time a new client would come into my office. I would rack my brain thinking, how will I be able to help this person? Putting pressure on myself, thinking that I needed to have experienced what they suffered, what they suffered from in order to help them. But then I would remember what one of my favorite professors, Dr. Tom Davis, told us in our training. It is helpful to be skilled and to have coping techniques to share with people, but the real change happens within the relationship. It is the relationship between client and counselor that creates the environment for healing to begin. These words eased my mind. After counseling for many years, I found them to be absolutely true. We are hardwired for human connection. Without connection, it is impossible for us to thrive. A common thing I hear from the people I work with are fears of being alone, not having friends or family that they can feel safe or connected with. And some people say that they need to speak with me because their friends and family are getting burned out hearing about their problems. Some of my clients have a lot to say, so much so that I barely get a word in. But at the end of our session, they thank me for listening and say that they feel lighter. I find it interesting that my 10-year-old daughter, Scarlett, says that she thinks my job must be boring. <laughs> now, I can't say that I like all the people that I work with. How could that be possible? But I absolutely love getting to know each person and developing our relationship. I have always been one of those people who loves the people watch and always am curious about what makes people tick, so to speak. So I managed to find the perfect calling for myself. I feel privileged to have people share their innermost secrets, thoughts, and feelings with me. And I think it is truly cathartic and therapeutic to be able to be vulnerable and feel safe with another human being. How often do we get to do that in our lives? Author Stephen Covey, Covey said, the biggest communication problem is, is that we do not listen to understand. We listen to reply. Brene Brown, in her book, Daring Greatly, writes that she is shocked by how many of us fail to acknowledge the humanity of the person helping us at stores and in the service industry due to always being on our phones. I sometimes... I've sometimes felt like younger workers don't take pride in their work or really care about what they're doing. Many seem to lack a sense of pride. Perhaps it's because they feel dehumanized due to most people not really communicating with them, <clears throat> but at them. Getting off our phones and making direct eye contact with the people we interact with on a daily basis would help them feel more human and connected, and it helps us too. Valerie Carr, author of See No Stranger, a memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love, says, deep listening is an act of surrender. We risk being changed by what we hear. When the story is done, we must return to our skin, our own worldview, and notice we have been changed by our visit. We are forever changed by the stories we hear and the connections we make during interactions with others. There is much we can learn from each other, but of course we need to feel heard and understood in order to feel connected. I encourage and invite all of you to allow yourselves to surrender the next time you are speaking with someone about personal, possibly painful topics. It takes a lot of courage to be willing to reveal your dark corners where our fellow humans can see what we are experiencing. But doing so helps us feel a lot more interconnected with humanity.
Thank you. And now um, our choir will sing um, I Am But a Small Voice by Roger Whitaker, arranged by Louise Porter and Post.
thank you. That was that was beautiful. That was really beautiful. Perfect for today. Uh, so I didn't want to uh, leave Emerson, as this is my last sermon, without um, celebrating some very important people that don't come up here on the dais, that often aren't seen in front of the congregation, but they're very important to any congregation. They often go unsung, and these are people I work with closely during my tenure, during my sabbatical ministry here at Emerson, and they are the pastoral care team. I wanted to thank them in the service, Pat Lindenauer, Heather Medfitz, and Pam Randall for the amazing work that they do, the three of them um, on our pastoral care team. It's, it's not easy, and like I said, it often goes unsung, so thank you. But that leads me. That leads me into what spiritual care is, what pastoral care is, what the love-dependent web of existence is, or the interdependent web of existence, as it's listed in our principles. Pastoral care provides practical and emotional support during life's transitions. That's, that's the need most often requested when we talk about what it, what it is, pastoral care. But pastoral care, however, is also... And it's arguably primarily spiritual support. The fact is, we are all called to minister to each other. We are all called to do that. We are all pastoral caregivers. And that is also why I'm talking about it today, especially in this time of great need for mutual spiritual support. I'm finding right now, especially with all that's going on in the world, we all need to care for each other. In the words of the theologian Thomas Merton, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. Pastoral care, broadly stated, is that act of offering unconditional love in order to repair and lift the spirit. And unlike the purely logistical side of pastoral support, and attending to spiritual support, one must envision, one must embrace spirit, spiritual support, and the divine as we each understand it. What does that mean? As a humanist, you've probably heard me say a number of times that I acknowledge the collective human spirit, representative of meaning that can be found in the world, in our connection to each other, as we've demonstrated today, in our connection to the earth, in relationships, Melissa talked about, in doing good deeds, doing good by giving of ourselves. I acknowledge a connection to the larger and profound divine that is the living energy that pervades all life, that is divine, within and between us all. So the act of loving freely, the act of showing that unconditional love, well, that seems straightforward, right? Just do it. It seems even simple when you, when you say it out loud, just love. But the execution of the same involves many complexities and risks. It's not easy. That is why today I formally acknowledge with gratitude those in our congregation who have undertaken the centering of this essential, difficult task within Emerson, our pastoral care team. Thank you. You see, when we undertake pastoral care, we are committing, we are committing to a loving connection where another living being invites you to be with them emotionally and spiritually. They're opening themselves to vulnerability as you do the same. That's why it's difficult. The author, Brene Brown, Melissa mentioned, frames this love as loving wholeheartedly, even if it hurts. And according to Brown, vulnerability, it's not weakness. It is courage, which is this month's theme. Vulnerability is courage. And so pastoral care, spiritual care, joining with each other in this community as we do, takes courage. They're all courageous in doing that. Plus, unlike a doctor who can often diagnose, treat, and cure a patient, most pastoral interactions don't provide any sort of cure or any sort of solution to a problem. But rather, they provide a partner in the struggle, which is so important, someone to encourage and support as you work through 
whatever you need, and then you support them as they work for whatever they need. Let's get a little more specific. When might one need pastoral care? When might one need spiritual uplift? You can all think of a million times that you need it, especially now. Well, there are joys and concerns, as I mentioned, and our team is notified sorrowful times and times of celebration. And if you ever hear of any, please let the pastoral care team know. However, since pastoral care is more than this much needed support that we usually associate with in the car rides, the food deliveries, the convalescent visits, all that stuff, etc., it's more than that. I'd like today just to consider some situations that would benefit from pastoral care, which may go unrecognized and, and therefore untreated. So the word pastor, if you didn't know, it also means shepherd. Um, pastors are known to shepherd their flocks, and that's etymologically, that's what it means. The less obvious pastoral functions are indeed also things you can consider a shepherd might be responsible for. Protection, making provisions, shielding, refreshing, restoring, strengthening, encouragement of the flock, comforting, guiding, tending to all manner of needs, to keep the individuals in the congregation healthy, happy, and thriving together. Anything that that takes. Therefore, spiritual care can also be, it's also someone just to talk to. It's someone to sit with, to brag to, because everyone else doesn't understand how important a success I had. Or someone to complain to, because others take that are hurt that I felt, they take it less than seriously and need someone to complain to. Someone to cheer you on. Someone to ground you. Someone to pray with, if that is what you do. To lift your spirit. To sing and dance with you. To listen to a poem you wrote. To, to, to listen to a plan or a goal you're excited or unsure about. To just scream to or scream with about the craziness in the world. I've been to it. That is helpful sometimes to talk to you about a tough issue with which you are wrestling, to problem solve, to repair a relationship, to comfort if a relationship is ending, to celebrate a relationship that's new, to dine or have coffee with, or even just to share a joke. And sometimes, in fact, in fact, often, our spirits need something we don't even understand until we ask for help until we get it. And since, as I mentioned, we are all called to minister to each other, these are all things we can do for each other. So I encourage you to ask. Ask the spiritual care team, even if you don't know what you need, and ask each other. Spiritual care is about what Melissa talked about. It's about relationship. It's about human connection. The author, Susan Pinker, declares that social contact is a biological need, like eating, or drinking, or sleeping. Especially in person human connection, we're connecting spiritually in other ways too, like we did in the, in the game, because we have to. But when we connect in person, it's so meaningful. So it's a biological need, like eating, drinking, or sleeping. Our bodies react to the loss of that interaction, the way we react to hunger. We need sometimes to have a slap on the back or a handshake or a hug, or we need to rest our shoulder on someone we love. That's spiritual care. We need this literally and figuratively. So pastoral care takes that a step further and includes not just the physical hug, but the spiritual hug. That's what it is. If you're like me, I need that, like that kind of metaphor, like that pastoral care as a spiritual hug. Rem remember the, the sign, free hugs, that people used to hold? So I can visualize that theological abstraction as a spiritual hug. And given that free hug suggestion, I'd like to take you a moment back to travel with you in time back to 2019, just after I first began my ministerial internship. It was in Michigan. One of the first assignments I was given in class as a new student in this class that oversaw my intern experience was to preach for 10 minutes to my intern committee on my personal theology using a single concept. So that was a bit of a challenge. Yeah, and I thought and I thought the concept I came up with back in 2019 was coincidentally free hugs. And over the past few years of ministry, 
that personal theology has evolved. It's evolved to help me conceptualize what it means to be a pastoral caregiver and a minister and why that task is so important and it is complex, as it is complex. So I talked about courage and risk in this wholehearted loving even if it hurts. So even in that initial framing of my personal theology of free hugs, there is potential for harm. Not everyone can give or receive physical hugs, physically or emotionally. Not everyone can do it. There are considerations of consent involved with hugging. Unsolicited hugs can actually be painful. Even with consent, we cannot expect that someone will hug back with the same intensity. And when I gave that sermon in 2019, 2019, I could not have ever foreseen that just around the corner, Hugging another human being could severely sicken them and even be considered a malicious act. Couldn't even consider it. Therefore, I have reconceived my personal theology and my charge as a pastoral caregiver. We're all in process, at least for now, as offering free spiritual hugs. So I may stand on the busy corner with a sign that says free spiritual hugs and see, see how people react to that. <laughs> When I attend pastoral uh, care sessions, I imagine connecting, absorbing. This is what I visualize as a spiritual hug. Absorbing all that positive life spirit I can, the energy of life that sustains and strengthens our ancestors and continues to flow through us and into future generations. I visualize this. For me, it actually shows up as this like bright, warm, soft energy in my belly. And I collect it all there before I enter the room, and it spreads throughout my being, the spiritual positive energy. And then it spreads, and then it surrounds me. And so in this state of being and developed by this loving spirit, that's how I give my spiritual hug. That's how I greet my pastoral care charge. Feel free to visualize, visualize in any way that helps you. I and freely share that energy of spirit. To um, And then I join together in that spiritual embrace. And I remain in that embrace and that energy as long as it's needed with faith without a plan, but faith in the ability of unconditional love to provide what is needed. It may not provide a solution or cure, but it provides what's needed in the moment. You don't even know what that is until, until you do it. And I, I'd like to repeat a third time that we are all called to minister to each other. When you take advantage of pastoral care, spiritual care, with others or with our team, you are deputized as a person, pastoral caregiver yourself. And if for no other reason, you should take advantage of pastoral care so that you may pass it on. As the world fights wars, actual literal wars, ideological wars, moral wars that divide humanity today more violently than I've seen in my 51 years, and as ties between friends and loved ones are torn asunder by the weapons of hate and fear, we must deploy our strongest weapon, which is love, to heal our spirits and to heal our entire society, to retaliate against and diffuse hatred and fear. Building a beloved community in our faith and the world at large, this thing I'm talking about, the spiritual care, the spreading love, it's not easy. It will take a level of courage that has heretofore been more elusive than we care to admit. Thankfully, I believe we are finally approaching an understanding of, of just how much risk, how much sacrifice, hard work, patience, compassion, empathy, and extreme love are needed to achieve a truly equitable human society. And as the life that us Unitarian Universalists aspire to, as life humanity aspires to, begins to enter our field of perception, I think it is. It is incumbent upon each of us to take hold with every ounce of spiritual strength we can muster and hug each other intensely. We must do that. To know the world we want and need, our faith must commit to setting the example of how to love more courageously than the world has ever known, more courageously. And I urge you to take advantage of free spiritual hugs wherever you can get them by exercising love that heals and moves us toward connection 
uncovering relationships, interdependence, and wholeness, we fulfill our, our second, third, and seventh principles. We commit to accept one another, promote spiritual growth, act with compassion in human relations, and we respect the interdependent, the love-dependent web of all existence of which we are a part. And with that, I'm going to try another thing to connect spiritually with our other UUs around the, around the country, actually. We're actually playing him. I love our choir here in person, and if you can sing along with him, that would be great. Everyone, please sing along with their hymn. But this is a bunch of people getting together for one of our, our beautiful hymns, number one, away. my life flows on an endless song. Um, in New York, over 100 people. Number one away. In endless song above earth's lamentations, I hear the rhythm of all of you that hails a new creation.
awesome. Yeah, I actually can keep from singing out loud because when I do at home, my wife and daughter start cringing. But no one can ever keep me from singing in my heart. And for those of us who can sing out loud or not, your heart can always sing. And I think that's what they're talking about. Um, I would like to close my benediction. I know a number of you have uh, seen me bake various things for the congregation. And this morning I got up last night and I wanted to bake some pastries, um, which I sort of ended up doing. Um, but I had no pastry flour and I barely had any all-purpose flour. So I used whole wheat flour, which you're not really supposed to use in pastries necessarily. So I mixed it with what little all-purpose flour I had. And I mixed it with also some Greek yogurt and honey and sweetening. And so it's a little bit softer. And I put some jam and lemon on top and some frosting. So I don't know what it is. It's like <laughs> it, it's the enriched whole wheat bun that's sweet or something. Anyway, so I decided to take my benediction um, from a bread ceremony. I don't know if you've ever done it. If you've ever done Emerson, you have. But there's a bread hymn. Uh, it was written by this person, Jim Connolly, that was done at a bread ceremony in the First Unitarian Church of Pittsburgh, their bread service back in 2015. So that's the benediction I'd like to use. And it goes, oh, let us learn to be like bread, to have the common touch, to give ourselves that others live and hunger not so much. Oh, maybe we be like well-made bread, like bread that's made just so be needed, formed, and fortified, and given room to grow. And let our crust be not so thick that we our goodness hide. Let those who seek their needs from us find tenderness inside. For those in need whose lives are pained by hunger, hurt, or strife, oh, let us learn to be their bread, to be their staff of life. Amen. Thank you. Please enjoy the coffee and there's muffins and some other things after this. I believe that Clinton wanted to say a few words from home. He was not able to be here today, so let's see if we can get him on. Yay, Clinton! Okay.
uh, presence and pastoral care for all of us um, as we continue to just wonder what, <laughs> where, where are we going as a country, where are we going as a world, where are we going as a human race, where is our earth going, and as we look around us here at Emerson today, with more and more people joining us back in service, um, I hear that there's a couple of folks who haven't joined us for a while. I'm so glad to see them, and um, also uh, very grateful for our, our coffee hour um, afterwards as well, just to celebrate your ministry um, here with us at Emerson Unitarian Universalist Church. Um, I know that there was a little uh, gift uh, that we had uh, brought for you. Um, I can't see whether or not um, it's uh, being given to you or, or not, but um, I'm sure it is. Uh, it is a beautiful stole <laughs> that I hope is in the colors um, that will uh, bring you joy and also remind you of us um, forever. And, uh, and of course, you are more um, than welcome and encouraged to come back, see us as much as you would like, because you will forever be um, such an important part of our community. I also have a little orchid here for you um, that I will set on the coffee table. And um, uh, hey, Margaret, too, thank you for setting up the coffee hour and happy birthday. Um, And uh, from the bottom of our hearts, especially all, that you've, uh, all those that you've touched here, thank you. Congratulations on your uh, your 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 upcoming ordination, and, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, flourish as a member of our community in the future. Thank you. 